Good morning. My name is Frank Ladd. I've been associated with the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand for more than 30 years. I'm quite pleased to speak with you this morning and to introduce our session on physics. What I'm going to demonstrate is that the defiance of Bell's inequality by the probabilities of quantum mechanics in the Gay-Donkin experiment derived from a mathematical mistake. That John Bell himself was never really convinced of the defiance of his inequality, either by the probabilities of quantum mechanics or by experimental evidence. He was concerned that if the properties of probability are different at a quantum scale than they are at a classical scale, then there must be some scale at which the properties of probability change. And what could that be? He suspected that something was wrong, but he wasn't sure what it was, but he did tender that someday we would probably find out. Well, I'm proposing to you that I have found out, and this is what I'd like to speak about with you today. The relevance of this report to the proposition of supplementary variables as an explanation for the incompleteness of quantum theory is that, whereas for a long time it has been understood that supplementary variables distributions are constrained by Bell's inequalities, the probabilities of quantum mechanics defy the inequalities. And thus the apparent empirical support given to the defiance of inequalities serves to nullify the prospects of the proposition of supplementary variables. What I'd like to speak to you about is that this understanding is just plain wrong. I presume that you're somewhat familiar with Alain Aspe's optical experiments in CHSH form, which he has reviewed very nicely in his memorial lecture on Bell's work entitled Bell's Theorem, The Naive View of an Experimentalist. So I shall not linger long on the explanation of his analysis, but I will linger when I get to what the error is involved and how that it might be resolved. My lecture today might be entitled Bell's Theorem, The Sophisticated View of a Theoretician. So let's get into it. The optical setup for Bell in the CHSH form according to Aspe. We're going to start out by we will energize a calcium atom. Energize it to the extent that two electrons will be propelled into a higher energy state. And as they make this quantum jump, they each will emit a photon, and we're going to propagate one towards station A and the opposite direction, one towards station B. We're traveling about a kilometer uh, distance in each direction, and the photon that comes to station A, which is monitored by Alice, this photon, when it gets there, is going to meet some polarizing material. Now, you'll know about polarizing material, that polarizing material has a direction to it. And if a photon is waving, to the photo fo waving into the polarizing material at the same rotational angle as the direction of the polarizing material, then the photon will pass right through. But if it comes to the polarizing material at right angles, it won't pass through. And at angles in between 0 and 90 degrees, it might pass through and might not pass through. And one of the glories of quantum theory is that quantum theory derives for us the probability that at any particular angle between 0 and 90 degrees, it will drive the probability that a photon passes through or doesn't pass through. So this is what's going to happen to this photon that's coming to the polarizer of Alice A. And, but this isn't just one photon, these are two, two photons. They've been prepared identically. They're moving at the same wavelength, they're going in opposite directions, and they're each going to meet a polarizer that's going to meet them in a perpendicular. But the twisted direction of the polarizer, Alice, of course, can twist her polarizer at any direction she would like, and so could Bob. But we're going to be interested particularly in two particular directions of the polarizer at which Alice might design her, her polarizer, and two particular directions for Bob. So we'll call Alice's two polarizing directions A and A prime, and Bob's are B and B prime. So when we do this experiment, we're going to send two identically prepared photons to Alice and Bob, and they're going to meet Alice and Bob in the direction either A, B, A, B prime, A prime, B, or A prime, B prime. That's the experiment we're going to do. Now, when Alice's pol uh, photon comes to her polarizer, it's either going to pass through the polarizer, in which case we will say that A of A star is equal to plus 1. And if it doesn't pass through the polarizer, we will say that A of A star is equal to minus 1. I write A star here because A star is the direction of Alice's polarizer, and that might be either A or A prime. And similarly for Bob. Bob will, will measure by B of B and lambda. Uh, is plus 1 or minus 1, depending on whether his photon passes through the polarizer or not. Now, this third other variable, lambda, has to do with, well, what's actually happening to this photon when Alice's photon comes to her polarizer and either passes through or not? The only thing we have specified about the experiment so far, the only thing that we actually know about, 
is the direction of Alice's polarizer. Is it A or is it at A prime? Well, the world's quite small down there, but there's conceivably lots of other stuff that's going on too. Though that other stuff, we're not sure just what it is that's relevant to the conduct of Alice's photon. We're not sure what it is, nor if we knew the dimension of this activity that's relevant to Alice's uh, photon. We're not sure what the setting of that, that dimension would be. These are what Einstein called supplementary variables. There are other things going on in th this experiment besides the setting of Alice and Bob's polarizing direction. We'll just designate them by lambda. We don't know what their values are, but this vector, if we knew what they were, we could, and we could measure them, we would designate their values by this vector lambda. So a of a, of a star and lambda is either plus 1 if it passes through, and minus 1 if it doesn't, and the same for Bob's. So what are the quantum probabilities? Well, let's think. What, what can happen if we do an experiment? Well, quantum theory specifies a joint probability distribution for all the possible results of our paired experiment. Do Alice and Bob's photons pass through their polarizer, or don't they? They could be. Either do they pass through? We could see yes, yes, no, no, yes, no, or no, yes. And quantum theory specifies that the probabilities are equal, that they both pass through, yes, yes, is equal to the probability that neither passes through, no, no, each of those probabilities is one-half the cosine squared of the relative angle between the direction of the two polarizers. And the probability for yes-no is the same as the probability for no-yes. Each of those is one-half the sine squared of the relative angle between the direction of the two polarizers at the two stations. Those four probabilities add to one. There are two of these. That makes the cosine squared plus two of those the sine squared. Those add up to one. And we notice about this joint distribution that in the former two probabilities, the product of the polarization observations is positive in both cases. The yes, yes gives a product of plus one. No, no gives a product of plus one. Whereas for the other two, yes, no, and no, yes, both give a polarization product of minus one. So this joint distribution specifies an expectation for that polarization product as plus one times, there's two of these, plus one times the cosine squared of the angle minus 1 times the sine squared of the angle between them, and the cosine squared of any angle minus the sine squared of the same angle is equal to the cosine of twice the angle between them. That's a standard trigonometric identity. So the expectation of the polarization product of the photon observations of Alice and Bob is cosine twice the relative angle between the direction of their polarizers. How about the marginal probability that Alice passes through her polarizer full stop, irrespective of Bob? Well, Alice can pass through her polarizer while Bob does and while Bob doesn't. So the probability that Alice passes through is equal to the probability that she passes and Bob does plus the probability that she passes and Bob doesn't. And the sum of those two probabilities are one-half the cosine squared of the angle plus one-half the sine squared of the angle. Cosine plus sine squared is one. So the marginal probability that Alice passes through is the same as the probability that Bob passes through. Both of those are equal to one-half. What about the conditional distributions? Well, the conditional distributions specify what are called the entanglement equations that specify the relation between the behavior of Alice's photon and Bob's photon. Well, these, first of all, let's look at the conditional probabilities. The conditional probability that Alice passes through, yes, given that Bob's does, yes, and the conditional probability that Alice passes through. Well, this result is pretty surprising. This is a surprising that stunned Einstein referred to this as the uh, spooky action at a distance. What it has to do with the fact is, how could it be that the probabilistic behavior of Alice's photon depends on two aspects of Bob's photon behavior? It depends on the, relative, the, the direction of the setting of his polarizer, and it also depends on whether Bob's photon passes through or doesn't pass through. Well, the funny thing about this relationship is that the direction of Bob's polarizer and Alice's polarizer in the experiments, it's not even determined until the two photons are ejected and are heading down their pathway to the polarizers. It's only after they leave that the directions of the, of the polarizers are set. So when Alice gets, Alice's photon gets there, she doesn't know, is she going to come in at A or at A prime? When she gets there, she finds out, but she's got no idea. Did Bob come in at B or B prime? He's two kilometers down the road from her. They've been traveling in opposite directions at the speed of light. How could she know what direction he's going? She couldn't. How could she know whether he passes through or not? She couldn't. So the fact that these two conditional probabilities are different is what Einstein referred to as spooky action at a distance, and they specify for us both the feature of quantum entanglement. When these probabilities are understood to be properties of the photon behavior, it's saying that the photon behavior of Alice is entangled with the photon behavior of Bob, even though 
Her local conditions are completely different from local conditions of Bob, and she doesn't even know what his are. So there's a feature of quantum entanglement. And the other feature about these observations, these probabilities, is that it's apparent that Bob's observation of his pull photon behavior, whether it's plus one or minus one, the observation has some effect on the probabilistic behavior of Alice's photon. These are called the entanglement equations, and these are the source of one of the quantum mysteries. Now, the physics. The specific angles for experimental detection. The situation is this. Is Alice could set her direction of her polarizer at whatever angle she wants, and so could Bob. It turns out that for some polarization pairings, Bell's inequality is understood not to be defied. And there are other pairings at which it is defied. And at some angle pairings, it's defied just a little bit. And at some angle pairings, it's, def it's defied the most. Well, when we get to the point of trying to find out some experimental observation relative to this question, uh, Elena Space thought, well, if we're going to go looking for uh, experimental evidence of the defiance of the inequality, let's go looking for it at the angle pairing at which the defiance is the greatest. And that's what we're going to refer to now. You see, you see the, the probability that Alice goes through and Bob goes through is cosines, one half the cosine squared of the relative angle between Alice and Bob, between their polarizers. Well, what's this relative angle? Alice is one kilometer down the road this way. Bob is that row one kilometer down the road that way. And if we're talking about the relative angle between Al the direction of Alice's polarizer and Bob's polarizer, notice this, that the xy axis facing z in Alice's direction, here's positive for x and here's positive for y. But when we're looking at Bob's, positive is in the opposite direction. There's positive for x and there's positive for y. So if we're going to talk about the relative angle between the position of Alice's polarizer and Bob's polarizer, what we would need to do is to take Alice's xy axis and let's swing it around and let's place it right on top of Bob's. Now we have aligned the directions of the two xy axes. And here's what we're going to do. Here's the four uh, directions that we're talking about. There's a direction A for Alice, a direction A for A prime for Alice, a direction B for Bob, and a direction B prime for Bob. Now, what are the relative angles between the most egregious purported violation of Bell's inequality? It works like this. The angle between Alice and Bob, Alice, angle between A and B is minus pi over 8. That's minus 22.5 degrees. Angle between A and B prime is minus 3 pi over 8. Angle between A prime and B is plus pi over 8, and the angle between A prime and B prime is minus pi over 8. Now notice these angles. If we double them, notice we'll double them. We'll double minus pi over 8 is minus pi over 4. So double these angles are minus pi over 4, minus 3 pi over 4, pi over 4, and minus pi over 4. And remember that the cosine of the polarization product between the polarization observations at A and B is the cosine of twice the angle between A and B. So it's pi over 4, double, doubled, we, the angles we're concerned about are plus pi over 4 and minus pi over 4, both of which the, the cosine is 1 over the square root of 2, and the cosine of minus 3 pi over 4, that cosine is minus 1 over the square root of 2. Those are the angles that we're talking about. And now we're ready to think about the, another four-ply experiment and a Gedanken experiment. The idea is this. Alice and Bob each can pick two different relative uh, directions for their polarizers. So we could do an experiment on a pair of photons at the relative angle AB. We could do a pol one at AB prime. We could do one at AB, A prime B, and one at A prime B prime. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to consider doing four experiments, four different pairs of photons, and we're going to define a quantity S, which is going to be a linear combination now, the polarization product at AB minus the polarization product at AB prime plus the polarization product at A prime B plus the polarization of A prime B prime. Well, if we did four different experiments on four pairs of photons, this first term could be plus one or minus one. This second term could be plus one or minus one. Same with the third and same with the fourth. So the values of S, if we did these four experiments on four different pairs of photons, the value of S could be minus four, minus two, zero, plus two, or plus four. Fair enough. Well, Einstein, remember, was concerned about this spooky action at a distance because he said, you know, when the Alice's photon comes into her polarizer, it doesn't have any idea what's going on at Bob's polarizer. He said this. He never disputed the entanglement probabilities for the plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, minus, minus. He never disputed those, but he did say this. When Alice is coming into her, photo, for her polarizer and whatever else is going on over there, whatever it is that's happening over there, it's got nothing to do with what's happening in this instance. The probability of plus, 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 minus, that depends on the relative angle between the two. But when you actually do one and hers turns out to be plus, suppose Alice is at angle A, she turns out to be plus one. He said, 
if Bob's is at B, this would have been plus 1. And if Bob's is at B minus, it would have been plus 1. Because what's going on at Alice has nothing to do with what's going on to Bob. It's local features that determine what's going on at Alice's polarizer. So if we did the experiment at A, B, the result at A would be the same as if we did the experiment at A, B prime. Well, this is, we now have to recognize uh, quite clearly that this has nothing to do with the principles of quantum physics because it's actually impossible to do the experiment. One pair of photons we cannot do and do it at A, B prime. You can do the one or the other. Those two experiments, which you could do with two different pairs of photons, with the same pair of photons you can't do them both. Those two experiments are incompatible. You can't possibly do it. And moreover, the generation of the probabilities that has to do with uh, the quantum physical generation of these probabilities through the operation of the Hadamard of the Hadamard operators. The operators don't commute for these two pairs of measurements. The uncertainty principle says that if you can't do two, two uh, measurements, you can't do two observations, then quantum physics will say nothing about, nothing about them. So quantum physics won't say anything about Einstein's principle that if A is 1, when we do it at angle Bob's is B, it's also going to be 1 when Bob's is at B prime. So we can't do this experiment, and quantum physics says nothing about the joint result of both of those experiments. But, well, we can think about it. <laughs> think about it. We can't do it, but we can think about it. That's why we talk about this as being a Gaydonkin experiment. And why we're going to think about it is this, is that, the is that the principle of local realism, remember, is going to say that if we did A at A with B of B, and we did A at A at B of B prime, well, the value of A at A would be the same in both of those experiments on the same pair of photons, so we can factor it out. So there we are. We have it factored out A of A times B of B minus B of B prime. And these two terms, you see, they both involve A of A prime. And if we did A at A prime with B of B and with B of B prime, the principle of local realism said that A of A prime should be the same. So let's factor it out. Now, under this condition that the principle of local realism holds and that we could do the, the Gaydonkin experiment, suppose we could do the experiment, what, could, what would be the possible values of S? Well, let's look. What could, hap what could be the values of B? Well, values of B at B and B prime might be the same. If they're the same, then this term is zero. And either whether they're plus or whether they're minus, this term is zero. If they're both plus, this term is 2. If they're both minus, this term is minus 2. In either case, a of lambda and a prime would be plus 1 or minus 1. So if b of b and b of b prime are the same, the value of s, all it can be is plus 2 or minus 2. Similarly, if b of b and b of b prime are different, if b of b is plus and b of b prime is minus, then this term is 0. And this term, plus and minus, that would make this plus 2. If this were minus and this were plus, that would be minus 2. This is going to be plus 2 or minus 2 in either instance, and a of a is only plus 1 or minus 1. So no matter what it is that would happen in the Gedanken experiment, the value of s could only be minus 2 or supposing that we could do this Gedanken experiment and supposing that the principle of local realism holds. So s under these conditions can only be minus 2 or plus 2. Well, what's the value of s? Well, s is the outcome of a random variable. That's how, that's how quantum physics works. It doesn't tell us what happens if we do an experiment. The mechanics don't tell us what happens. It tells us only the probabilities. So the result is an, a random variable. Say, well, what's the expected value of s? Well, s, remember, is a linear combination of four polarization products. And the expectation of a linear combination is the same linear combination of the expectations. That's a rule of probability. That, that's true for every probability distribution you're talking about. The expectation of a linear combination is linear combination of the expectations. So the expectation of S is the expectation of the polarization product, this one, minus the expectation of that one, plus the expectation of that one, plus the expectation of that one. And what is an expectation? It's a convex combination of the possibilities. If the possibilities for the results of the Gedanken experiment are minus 2 or plus 2, the expectation had better be between minus 2 and plus 2. That's what Bell's inequality says in this context. Okay, well, this Bay Bell quandary, what if we would apply the quantum mechanic probability and expectations to these four egregious angles? Remember, twice AB is either plus pi over 4 or minus pi over 4 in three of the situations. Cosine of pi over 4, those are all 1 over the square root of 2. And the minus 3 pi over 8 that got doubled to minus 3 pi over 4, that cosine is minus 1 over square root of 2. So it would seem that this expectation of S, which is a linear combination of these expectations, 1 over square root of 2 minus minus 1 over square root of 2 plus square root of 2, is 4 over the square root of 2. And 4 over the square root of 2 is 2 times the square root of 2, and that's bigger than 2. The probabilities of quantum mechanics defy Bell's inequality. And that's wrong. I'm telling you, that's wrong, and I'm going to show you why that's wrong. It's wrong because of some neglected functional relations among the components of the linear combination that defines S. What are we talking about? 
Well, suppose we could do the Gedanken experiment. We can't do the Gedanken. Well, so we're just thinking about it. If you want to think about it, let's think. What could possibly happen if we did this re Gedanken experiment? Take one pair of photons and send them to all four of these angle pairings. What could possibly happen? What would happen if we observed A of A and B of B, A of A and B of B prime, A of A prime and B of B, A of A prime and B of B? What could possibly happen? Each one can be only plus one or minus one. In each of those cases, what's the polarization product? Each one of those can only be plus one or minus one. We'll talk also about a mysterious product, script A, script B. Okay, and we'll talk about four symmetric function quantities that we're going to call sum. Sigma means sum. Sigma, but don't sum in AB. Sigma, but don't sum in AB prime. That's what we're going to be talking about next. What we're going to do on the next page, we're going to show a matrix. What this matrix is, is here. We call this the realm matrix, or the possibility matrix for the observations that we could make if we could do the Ganakan experiment. We would have observed A of A, B of B, A of A prime, B of B prime. We would have observed the polarization products. There's this funny quantity we'll talk about. There are these summations, and here's the value of S. You see, when we observe these polarization products, we can compute the value of S. The columns of this matrix list the ensemble of measurement possibilities for the results of the Gedanken experiment on a single pair of photons emitted toward all four of the tendered polarizer direction pairings as restricted by the principle of local realism. That's what we're going to look at now. This is the realm matrix. Well, what could the values of A and A, B of B, A of A prime, B of B, each one could be plus one or minus one. They could all be plus one. They could all be minus one. They could be, there are 16 possibilities. Each one could be plus one or minus one. There are 16 possibilities for each of those vectors of four observations. If we did the Gedanken experiment, if we could do it, the result of our experiment would be one of these four columns. Well, take any one of those columns. If this, if say this third column were our, if that's what we observed in the Gedanken experiment, that would mean Next one, I'm going to say, well, what's the product AB? What's the product AB prime? What's the product A prime B? And what's the product A prime B prime? The second bank of columns just takes the first bank of columns and say the third column is the one we're talking about. This first component here is the product of the first two. There's A with B, one. The next one is A with B prime. A with B prime, again, is one. Here's A prime with B, is product is minus one. Here's A prime with B prime, the product is minus one. So every one of the columns of the second bank of columns are the component-wise products of the first bank of columns, which just uh, list the polarization observations themselves. Well, before going any farther, let's look and see what we have. A, a B, A prime, and B prime. We have 16 columns of different observations. And look, we have 16 columns for the polarization products as well. There's one, the first, second, the third, the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. Oh, the ninth column is the same as the eighth column. And the tenth column is the same as the seventh column. And the eleventh column <laughs> is the same as the sixth column. And the sixteenth column is the same as the first column. Whereas we had sixteen distinct columns of polarization observations, we only have eight distinct columns of polarization products. There's only eight of them there. And what that tells us, since there are four of them, it tells us that one is going to be a function value of the other one. Let's see how this works. The first thing I'd like to show you is that this third polarization product, A prime, B prime, that's the fourth row here. We're just going to look at the first eight columns here. Let's look at the first eight columns of the first three polarization products. Well, there's the three ones, and there's the three minus ones. And here's one minus one in the second place, one minus one in the third place, one minus one in the fourth place. Here's the two minus ones in the middle two, there's the two minus ones up there, and there's the two minus ones uh, over here. You see, the first eight columns of the first three rows exhaust the Cartesian product of possibilities for the polarization products A, B. So since they exhaust those possibilities, the fourth one says for each of those possibilities, it says the value of the fourth one, that fourth one is a function of those first three. Because the next eight columns, the first three are just going to repeat, and the fourth one's going to repeat exactly its function value because the second half of the matrix is just the folded uh, components of the first half of the matrix. Well, not only that, not only is the fourth polarization product a function of the first three, it's also true that any one of these polarization products is the same function value of the other three. The easy one to look at, let's look at the first one, A, B, that polarization product. Let's look at the second, third, and fourth polarization products. Once again, if we look at those first eight rows, we'll find out here's the three plus ones, here's the three minus ones, here's two plus ones there, there's two plus ones there, there's two plus ones there, 
Now here's a single plus one, there's a single plus one, and there's a single plus one. You see, this, when we're talking about the, the second, third, and fourth row, the first eight columns, they exhaust the Cartesian product of minus one plus one cubed. And for each one of those possibilities, the first row tells its function value. Well, that's sort of interesting. And what's that going to do for us? Well, here's an interesting one. The fourth row of the polarization product, we call that A of A prime, B of B prime. That's an Alice and Bob polarization product. Right next to it, I put another quantity, and I didn't write it plain old Roman AB. I wrote script A, script B, as this one is not an Alice and Bob quantity. There's the Alice and Bob A prime, B prime. This one's an Aspe Bell quantity. And look at the Aspe Bell quantity. For those eight possibilities for the first three rows, the first eight columns, Aspe Bell say plus one. And for the second eight possibilities for the first three rows, Alice, uh, Aspe Bell say minus one. You see, this is the quantity that Aspe Bell think they are assessing when they just stick in expectation for this one, expectation for that one, expectation for that one, to get their expectation of S as two square root of two. They, th they think they're assessing this one, but they're, well, that is what they're assessing, but they're assessing it mistakenly. That's the mistake. Each one of these polarization products is the same linear combination of the other three. And now let's look at this, way down at the bottom. If we would compute for each one of these columns the value of S, just like we're supposed to for the Gadonkin experiment, plus this, minus that, plus that, plus that is 2. Plus this, minus that, plus that, plus that is 2. Plus this, minus this, plus this, plus that is minus 2. You see, the value of S is always 2 or minus 2, just as we had thought before. Now, instead of using the Alice and Bob polarization product, we use the Aspe one. Plus 1, plus, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, plus 1. That's 2. Plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, not this one, but that one, plus 2, we get 4. Look at that. Plus that, minus that, plus that. Don't plus this one, but plus this one. We don't get 2, we get 4. You see, if you put in Alice and ba uh, Aspe Bell polarization product, their quasi-polarization product, it's not a polarization product at all. It's a phantom. S, putting in the Aspe Bell quantity, can it be anywhere from a, a minus 4 up to plus 4. And so it's no surprise that their expectation is 2 times the square root of 2, bigger than 2. But that's not the expectation of S. That's a mistake. Here's the other one. A, B, polarization product, how is that a function of the other three? Well, look, let's just look at this first one. It says, take the summation here. Take the summation of the polarization products, but don't sum the first one. Just sum the second three. What, what do we get? You watch the second row of numbers, and while you're looking across that row, I'm going to be just summing up this second, third, and fourth column. We'll get 3, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1, plus 1, minus 3, plus 1, plus 1, minus 3, plus 1, plus 1. Minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 3. Well, that's what we did there. This sigma without of polarization products, but don't count AB, that's a function of the other three polarization products. And that's a function of the other three polarization products. And what I'm going to tell you now is that that first polarization product, if this summation turns out, to, if this summation here, the summation turns out to be plus 3 or minus 1, then this polarization product is going to be plus 1. And if this polarization product down here is minus 3 or plus 1, this polarization product is going to be minus 1. You look across this top row here, and you watch, and I'm just going to be looking across this bottom row. Whenever I see plus 3 or minus 1, I'm going to say plus. Whenever I see minus, plus 1 or minus 3, I'm going to say minus. So you watch your top, this row. Of, I'm just looking down here. I'm going to say plus, 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 minus, 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 minus. Plus, 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 plus. You see that first row is this function of the, th of the fourth row. Well, you could do that for any one of these four functions. Sum up the polarization products, but don't count A prime B. After this yak, this is what you know. Sigma slash polarization angle is the sum of the polarization products at the other angles. It's on the other three. Similarly, no matter which one, you put the slash A star B star, sum the polarization products at the other three. And then what we learn is that the one that was not involved in the sum that polarization product is the indicator of, was that sigma 3 or minus 1? Yes. So we'll make that a plus 1 minus, was that 3 or minus 1? No. So that would, the term would be 0. But if the sigma is minus 3 or plus 1, then this term would be yes. So this is minus 1. And if it's, if it's minus 3 or plus 1, that indicator is no. The polarization product at A prime B prime is a function value, G, a Gedanken function of the polarization product at the other three. And similarly for the other three. This happens four times. There are four different ways we could make one of those 
Polarization products are a function of the other three. These are completely symmetric functional relations. And what does that do for us? Well, it does this. We were interested by the expectation of the Ganachian quantity S. It is a linear combination of the expectations. That's sure true, but when you take those expectations, this expectation in one form, it will be the expectation of the first one, minus the expectation of the second one, plus the expectation of the third one, plus the expectation of the function of those three. Not a free Bell quantity, it's the expectation of the function of those three. Or we could say, we'll take this expectation minus this expectation plus this expectation plus that expectation of that function of those three. Or this expectation plus this expectation plus this expectation minus this expectation of that function of those three. There are four such representations. Well, what are we going to do for this expectation of this Gedanken function? What's the expectation of that? Who's ever talked about something like that? Well, enter Bruno De Finetti in the Fundamental Theorem of Probability. The Fundamental Theorem of Probability says this. In a word, it says this. If you specify your expectations for any quantities whatsoever, you can say whatever you want. Let's think about some other quantity. We can compute, using a linear programming problem, we can compute the bounds on the expectation of that extra quantity if it's to cohere with the expectations that you've just said so far. That's called the Fundamental Theorem of Probability. Here's what it looks like mathematically. It says, consider any vector x n plus 1 of any quantities whatsoever. First of all, we'll identify their realm matrix. If we have a vector of n plus 1 quantities, their realm matrix will have, let's say, k columns, some finite discrete columns of possibilities. Suppose you assert e of x n is a vector p n. Then, a further assertion of E x n plus 1, the last component, coheres with what you've said so far, if and only if it lies within the minimum and the maximum of this last linear combination of a vector q k. There are k columns in this, in this uh, realm matrix. Minimum and the maximum of the last row times q k, subject to the restriction that the first n rows times the q k vector are the expectations that you've just specified, and the sum of those QKs better add up to 1, and they better all be bigger than 0, because an expectation is a convex combination of possibilities. That's what an expectation is. If there's no feasible solution to these uh, specified expectations, then what you've said so far is incoherent. Well, suppose we apply that theorem to the quantum probabilities. What do the coherent assertions of quantum mechanics specify? Well, the expectation of 1, 1 is 1. The expectation of 1 is 1. There's no doubt about that. The expectation, if you did an experiment at AB, the expectation, the convex combination of these possibilities is 1 over square root of 2. If you do an, if you do an, expect, uh, uh, an experiment at AB prime, the convex combination of these, expect, of these possibilities is minus 1 over square root of 2. If you do the experiment at A prime B, the convex combination of these possibilities is 1 over square root of 2. That's what quantum, and we're wondering, well, what's the expectation of S of lambda? If we do a Gedanken experiment, the same experiment on all four, four photon pairs, which you can't do, we're just thinking about it. Let's keep thinking. Quite fundamental theorem, if you do those, polar, those uh, linear programming problems, you find out quantum mechanic probabilities for a polarization pair are coherent for any angle setting. Put in that one, you get, coher you get a coherent Q. Put in this one, you get a coherent Q. Put in this one, you get a... Put in... There's nothing wrong with the quantum mechanic probabilities. Nothing wrong at all. But it also says you can assert these quantum mechanic probabilities for two photon polarization products at two different angle uh, directional pairings. You can put in two, and that would be coherent. You could put in three, that would be coherent. But if you put in these quantum mechanic polarization products for the same photon product at all four angle pairings, that's incoherent. So the question would be, if you did assert expectations for the first three, what would the coherent implications be for the fourth one and for the expectation of S? So that's what we'll look at next. This is a table, and it's going to show. What does the fundamental theorem of probability say about the quantum mechanic expectations for S? We're going to do eight, po eight linear programming problems here. We're going to do a minimum and a maximum linear programming problem where we're going to try to find the bounds on E of S, the minimum E of S and the maximum of E of S, if you assert quantum mechanic probabilities, not for this one, A, B prime. The first one says, assert expectations for A, B, A prime, B, and A prime, B prime. Then what would be the minimum, minimum and maximum values of the expectation of S? Linear programming problem tells us it's bounded between 1.1213 1. 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2. Suppose you asserted three, three expectations of quantum mechanics, but you don't assert the A prime, B prime. You assert the A, B, the A prime, B, and the A, B prime. What are the bounds, the minimum and the maximum expectation of, X, of S? 
1.1213 to 2. That happens for each one of these four paired minimum maximum expectations of S for the four representations of the quantity S. Three uh, polarization products plus the function of those three. Expectation of S is not 2 times the square root of 2. It's some interval between 1.1213 and 2. What about the solution vectors to the linear programming problems? See, a linear programming problem is posed like this. Find the vector q for which this combination of q's is a minimum. Find the vector q for which this combination of q's is a maximum, subject to the restrictions that these combinations of q's are the, prop are the expectations that you've specified, and those q's better sum to 1, and they better all be positive. Well, these are just lists. These are vectors q. These are vectors q8. There are eight components in each one of these vectors. There's a q, an extreme q vector for a minimization problem from minimum a prime b prime maximum a prime b prime. Minimum a prime b maximum a prime b. Minimum a prime a b prime maximum a b prime. Minimum a b maximum a b. You see the minimums, those are permutations of each other. These are the same numbers, but they're just in different order. This one is the same numbers, but they're in different order. These are the same numbers, but they're in a different order. In that one problem where the expectation is negative, the minimum and the maximum reverse. But same for the maximum q vectors. They're permutations of, of each other. There's one of them, there's another one. It's in a different order there, you can see. So these are the extreme q vectors. So these are eight-dimensional vectors, but this matrix of eight, eight-dimensional vectors, does, I mean, it doesn't have rank eight, it has rank four, because each one of those vectors is constrained by four linear equations. They better sum to one, and three different linear combinations better be the expectations that you've asserted. So each one of those vectors have in eight-dimensional space have four linear restrictions on them, so the rank of this matrix is only four. Now, so they represent the vertices of a four-dimensional polytope, a four-dimensional polytope. And what would that polytope look like? Well, what we're going to do, let's go back. Each one of those Q vectors, those would specify probabilities for any one of the, any, any one of the uh, results of the, of the Gedanken experiment that we wanted. And what we're going to do is we're going to take each of those eight four, eight dimensional vectors and we're going to specify for them the four-dimensional vector that specifies the plus-plus probability at the angle pairing AB, at the angle pairing AB prime, at A prime B, and at A prime B prime. So those eight-dimensional vectors, we're going, to, we're going to turn them each into a four-dimensional vector, and those four-dimensional vectors are going to specify the plus-plus properties at each of the four directional pairings. So if you specify a P plus plus, you're specifying the whole distribution at the, at the directional pairing AB, at AB prime, A prime, B prime. So these eight vertex ver vectors are the solutions to the, the linear programming problems. Those tell us these eight four-dimensional vectors in P++ space. Well, how do you see the four-dimensional vectors in P++ space? We're going to see those four-dimensional vectors just the same way that the creatures in Flatland, remember a 19th century novel, they were living in two-dimensional space, and they were all triangles and rhomboids and vertices and uh, lines, and things. they had their society going along, and one day they saw a very strange thing. A, uh, a, there, a point appears, and the point becomes a little circle, and the circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it gets smaller and smaller, and then it goes away. And they thought about this, and they realized there's another dimension to life. What they were observing was a sphere that was passing through their plane, and when it came to the plane, it just touched, and then as it passed through, the intersections were bigger and bigger uh, circles, and as it passed through, the circles got smaller and smaller, and it disappeared. Well, that's what we're going to watch and watch a movie that was directed by one of my colleagues, Rachel Tappenden. She did the programming for this. I'm not going to show you the, the, the end time, but we're going to watch the movie in slow-mo. We're going to pass this four-dimensional polytope through three-dimensional space, and we're going to pass it along the direction of the uh, axis corresponding to the P++ of A prime B prime. See, the smallest this can be is zero, and it can get bigger. It can get as big as 4.4268, and that's all it can be. So what we're going to do is we're going to, along the direction of this axis, P++ of A prime B prime, we're going to start slicing this four-dimensional polytope, and as we slice it, the slices will be three-dimensional figures. We'll see them, and this is what they look like. Okay, you see that the titles, headings of these pictures are P++ at A prime B prime at 0, at 0 0.1098, 0 0.2197, 0 0.2561, 0 0.3201, 0 0.4268. What happens, at 0, that's when, the, when this polytope first appears in three-dimensional space. The, the directions of the three-dimensional space, this is P++ of AB prime, here's P++ of AB, and there's the direction for P++ of A prime B. So it just appears as a point. As we start slicing at bigger values, oh, that point becomes a tetrahedron, a tiny tetrahedron. And as we slice higher, the tetra tetrahedron gets bigger. 
And if slice higher, it gets bigger still. Oh, but his nose got cut off. And it gets bigger, so we slice it bigger. It gets bigger still, more of his nose cut off. It gets to be 0.4268. It gets to be quite a big tetrahedron, but his nose is cut off its face, and then it disappears. That's what quantum theory tells us about the expectation of S. The expectation of S is not 2 times the square root of 2. The expectation of S, supported by the principles of quantum mechanics, say that the expected value of S in the Gaydonkin experiment, CHSH form, is an interval somewhere between 1.1213 and 2, and it's supported by a four-dimensional space of vertices of conclusions to, to a linear programming problems. Well, what about Alain Aspe? He comes along in 15 le years later after John Bell. He's a young guy. He's saying, oh, you mean this great result of quantum mechanics? It's, it's the result of a Gedanken experiment? You mean there's no physical evidence? Well, I'm going to get some physical evidence. Look at the expectation of S. Expectation of S is a linear combination of four expectations. We don't know what those expectations are, but I'm going to estimate them. We're going to estimate them by real experiments. So what we'll do is we'll do a bunch of experiments at AB. We'll do a bunch of experiments at AB prime. A bunch of experiments at each one of the angle pairings. When we do it at AB, what we'll do is we'll count out, well, how many of them are plus plus? How many of them are minus minus? How many of them are plus minus? How many of them are minus plus? And we're going to estimate the expectation of the polarization product A at A, B at B. Estimate of the expectation of the polarization product at AB this denominator, that's the total number of experiments, the total n at a, b. Some are plus, plus, some are plus, minus, some are minus, plus, some are minus, minus. That denominator is just the total number. And the numerator says, well, we'll put plus whenever the polarization product is plus, plus. We'll put plus whenever it's minus, minus. And we'll put minus when it's plus, minus, and minus, plus. And we'll estimate the expected value of a, b. And we'll do the same with our experiments at a, b prime, and the same with a prime, b prime, and the same. Well, that's fair enough. You go ahead and make those estimates. But don't pretend that you're estimating a Gedanken experiment, because the Gedanken experiment says that those four polarization products, if you make your stacks of your, your, uh, your, your observations, stacks of first at AB, first at AB prime, that fourth one, it can't be any old polarization product. It better be the function of the first three. That's what we're going to do here. See, I don't have space data, but he wrote a fabulous essay in 2002, a memorial essay about Bell's work. Bell's theorem, the naive view of an experimentalist. So I don't have the data. I simulated the experiments at AB using quantum probabilities, one half cosine square of the angle between AB. I did a million at AB, a million at AB prime, a million at A prime B, and a million at A prime B prime. I, I computed the polarization products for those million pairs at each. I computed Aspe's estimate of the expectation of A star B star, and these expectations estimated were 0.70, so those are 0 .70, minus 0 0.706, 0 0.706, 0 0.707. And we then made Aspe's estimated expectation of S is going to be E of A polarization product at AB minus this expectation plus that estimated expectation. Aspe's estimated expectation of S is 2.87738. Well, that's 2 times the square root of 2, to four decimal places, I think. Well, the problem is, obviously, that if you do it at AB, AB prime, and A prime B, the fourth one can't be any old polarization product at AB prime it had better be the function value of those first three. So what I did for this first column here is I said, take the polarization product simulated for the second, third, and fourth column. For each one of those rows, compute the function value of those three and compute the value of the polarization product here that it's bound to be. And then use Aspe's estimated expectation equation to compute the estimated expectation of the function of those other three. For the second column, put in the function values of those three and estimate Aspe's polarization product for that appropriately constrained value of the fourth one that's a function of the three. I did that for each one. The third one, take the polarization products at the first, second, and fourth, uh, the constrained value of that polarization product. Now we estimate those es estimated expectations of polarization products at the fourth one that was designed as the function value. And finally, the corrected estimated expected value of S for this first column, it says, we'll take the this expectation minus this expectation plus this expectation plus this expectation, you get 1.767. For the second column, it says take this expectation minus this expectation plus this expectation plus this expectation, and we'd get 1.765. Those are four different because we've done four different simulation experiments. If we take the average of those four, you get 1.76772. That's the corrected Aspe's expectation of S when you take into account that we're estimating the expectation of S for a Gay-Duncan experiment. Well, who cares? 
Well, we all care, because this is the point, is that what Aspe proposed in his essay, his memorial essay, he said this, supplementary variables distribution for the outcomes of the Gedanken experiment are constrained by Bell's inequality, but that the probabilities of quantum mechanics defy Bell's inequality. Well, the first of those things is true. Uh, supplementary variables distributions, they're bound up by Bell's inequality. Every probability distribution is bound up by Bell's inequality, including quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics probabilities do not defy Bell's inequality, and because he thought that his empirical results showed that the, prob the quantum mechanic probabilities which defy Bell's inequality, inequality are also defied empirically, he thought he was proving that the supplementary variables distributions were impossible. But that's just not true. The ex expectation does not defy Bell's inequality about uh, space experiments, nor the subsequent e experiments that have gone on. You know, there were the seven loopholes that were supposed to be challenged, and the seven loopholes each got resolves individually, and finally, uh, uh, we have re just recently done an experiment that closed all seven loopholes altogether, that, uh, supposedly defying local realism and defying Bell's inequality. Well, the problem is that there's nothing wrong with the experiments. The problem is that the computation is wrong. If you have expectations, uh, three of them, from whatever experiments you do, if you're doing the Gedanken experiment, you better make the fourth one equal to the function value to which it's constrained. So comments and conclusions. Thanks very much to our video photographer, Henry Schustak. Bell's inequality is not defied by the probabilities of quantum theory, and Bell will be pleased. He suspected this all along, and now he may rest in peace. There you go, John. Uh, Einstein's pleased, too, because the locality of quantum phenomena is preserved. Presuming local realism, the expectations of quantum theory support Bell's inequality. And so the locality of quantum mechanics is, is preserved. Uh, entanglement, the entanglement equations are not challenged as a technical matter. It turns out that if you think about probabilities as representations of uncertainty, the meaning of those entanglement equations is something quite different than what they're thought of when people say they're talking about entangled, entangled uh, photon behavior. And as a result of this, uh, <laughs> the investigation of supplementary variables it's full on. It turns out there's a whole literature of what are called no-go theorems championed in a paper by Greenberger, Horn, Shimony, and Zeilinger, which proposed to show that you don't even need any qualities to show the impossibility of supplementary variables. They, they proposed an analysis that was supposed to show that if you try to formalize supplementary variables theories in dimensions greater than two, you will come to a contradiction. Well, I've I analyzed that paper 25 years later, and I found out that they put the contradiction into the paper themselves. That paper is really riddled with mistakes, and here are some things I would suggest you to read. You can download these PowerPoints on ResearchGate sites. Just look for Frank Ladd. You'll find the PowerPoints. The quantum violation, this is a paper, Quantum Violation of Bell's Inequality, a Misunderstanding Based on a Mathematical Error of Neglect. That reviews the talk I've just given. There's a paper here where I showed how to do this impossible thing that these people claimed about the, the no-go drums, the thing you're not able to do. I showed how to do it in that paper. And the third paper is a paper that's been published, the GHSZ Argument, a Gedanken Experiment Requiring More Denken. And I'll finally, I'll just leave you with this reference to a paper by Romano Scazzafava, who's also a subjective probabilist, uh, quite well worth reading. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, and thank you very much. I'm very happy to talk with you. Thanks.